Our next speaker is Greta Christina. I'm done, I'm done. Drop the mic. Greta Christina is one of the most widely read and well-respected bloggers in the atheist blogosphere. She's the author of Why Are You Atheist So Angry? 99 Things That Piss Off the Godless. An Amazon bestseller in the atheism category and was ranked by an independent analyst as one of the top 10 most popular atheist bloggers. She's a regular atheist correspondent for Alternet, the online political magazine with over one million hits a week, and has been writing about atheism and skepticism for her own cleverly, cleverly named Greta Christina's blog since 2005. Her writings have appeared in numerous magazines, newspapers, and anthologies, including Miss, Skeptical Inquiry, the Chicago Sun-Times, and the anthology Everything You Know About God is Wrong. She's been writing professionally since 1989 on topics including sex, sexuality and sex positivity, LGBT issues, politics, culture, and whatever crosses her mind. She's an experienced and entertaining public speaker who's been doing public speaking for many years, even tried some comedy lately. Um, and she is this year's honored hero for the Foundation Beyond Beliefs Light the Night Walk for the Leukemia and Lymphoma uh, Foundation. Um, and she's on our Speakers Bureau for the SSA. And her presentation tonight will be on activist burnout, pre pre prevention and treatment. Help me in welcoming Greta Christina. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming out and rushing back from dinner and all of this. I love you guys. Um, uh, Mike, OK? Everybody can hear me? OK. Um, so I am talking today about the prevention and treatment of activist burnout. So. Everybody in the atheist movement, and especially in atheist leadership, is enormously excited about the student atheist movement. I mean, students are the future of this movement. That's kind of a cliche. But as Liz Liddell likes to point out, students are not just the future of this movement. Students are the present of this movement. You know, you know students, students are doing a huge amount of the on-the-ground community building and visibility work that everybody in the community keeps nattering on about how what we need to be doing. Um, and you're doing it really well. Um, and we want every single student in the atheist movement to stay in the atheist movement after you graduate and for years to come. You know, we want every single person in this room and every single person who's going to be in the room at the SSA East Conference and everybody in all the groups you're representing to stay in this movement for a long time. I mean, think about this. If every single student in, the stu in any student atheist organization stayed involved in the movement, even in just some small way, after they graduated, think about what the world would look like and how radically changed it would be in just a few years. You know, now that involvement could take lots of different forms, and I'll talk about that more in a bit. That involvement could take the form of participating in local groups, uh, joining national organizations, participating in atheist events, doing online visibility and activism, financially supporting atheist organizations, simply being an out atheist in your everyday life. But whatever form your activism takes, we want you in it for the long haul. We do not want you to burn out. Student activists are some of the best activists we have in this movement. We want you around for a long time. So how are we going to make that happen? There is one big message. This is the message that I want all of you to remember, even if you don't remember anything else about this talk. It's the message that everything else I'm talking about today hinges on. I mean, pretty much this entire talk is 20 minutes of me repeating this message over and over and over again, and then kind of yammering on about the finer points. Um, and in fact, um, I'm doing something kind of unusual today. Um, I normally don't use PowerPoint, but for this talk, I have created an analog PowerPoint slide, because I want to make sure this point really gets across. This is my analog PowerPoint slide. Self-care is not selfish. Okay. So, so, so here's an analogy. Think about a fruit tree. If a fruit tree doesn't get water and sunlight and fertilizer, it's going to stop making fruit. 
Or, or think about a car. If a car doesn't get gas and oil and maintenance and repairs, it's going to stop going forward. If you want to keep bearing fruit, if you want to keep moving forward, you need to replenish yourself. You, know, you need to give yourself fuel. You need to give yourself sunlight. You need to take care of yourself. Um, and, and the first and foremost form that this takes is take care of your physical health and your mental health. I mean, you're an atheist. You presumably know that you do not have a soul that is separate from your body. You are your body. So take care of that body. And that includes the part of your body that is your brain. Um, get regular exercise. Eat a healthy diet. Manage your stress. Get enough sleep. And I know I sound like your grandmother. I sound like a really boring presentation in sixth grade health class. You know, eat your vegetables and don't stay up so late. <laughs> yeah. But really, trust me on this, taking care of your health is not stodgy. Taking care of your health is a radical act of empowerment. And in particular, it is a radical act of empowerment to take care of yourself in a world that dismisses and demonizes atheists. Every time you take care of yourself, you are defying the people who say that atheists are second class, the people who say that we don't deserve care. Taking care of yourself is a radical act of empowerment, and it is radical long-term activism. You are one of the people who matters. You are going to change the world, and you are going to be much more effective at changing the world if you are powerful and strong. R seriously, think about this. Creating a world that is full of motivated, energetic, resilient, atheist activists that is not boring. That is badass. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> now, it's OK if you push yourself in somewhat unhealthy ways for sh**. I mean, if it's the week before the big conference, I mean, of course, you're going to stress out and eat pizza for every meal and get four hours of sleep every night. You know, I'm not going to try to talk you out of that. I'd be an idiot if I tried to talk you out of that. Also, I'd be a hypocrite if I tried to talk you out of that, because I do that too. You know, when it's a few weeks right before I have a book deadline coming out, you bet I'm doing that. But that should be the exception. That should not be how you live your life all the time. Um, and as a matter of fact, getting rest and exercising and getting enough sleep and managing your stress in your everyday life, that's what gets you the energy to manage the stressful, ridiculous times of your life when you're you know, getting four hours of sleep and eating pizza all the time. Um, and if you're ever tempted to live your life like that all the time, because there's so much to be done, and there's so few people to do it, and there's not enough hours to do it in, remember the burnout mantra. And in fact, I'm going to see if we can do something really dorky. Can we say this all together? Self-care is not selfish. Thank you. Um, and there's a, so there's a, this particular form of taking care of yourself, and in particular of taking care of your mental and emotional health that I think is hugely important for activists. And that is to carve out a life for yourself and an identity for yourself that's separate from atheism. And I, I had this realization about this a little while ago for my own life. Um, I started noticing that when friends asked me, how are you? You know, it's like friends would say, hey, I haven't seen you for a little while. How are you doing? And I would see things like, oh my gosh, we just raised over almost $100,000 for the Secular Student Alliance. You know, where I'd say, you know, oh my gosh, there's this discussion of harassment policies at conferences, at atheist conferences, and it's turned into this stupid firestorm that's eating the internet. And I started realizing my friends did not ask me how atheism was. <laughs> my friends asked me how I was. You know, yes, atheism is important to me, but I am not atheism, and atheism is not me. Um, so, get a life. I mean, I know, you know, people say that in this, like, obnoxious, jerky way. I am not, I am saying this in a loving, entirely sincere way. Get a life separate from activism. Get a hobby. Take up, like, clog dancing or playing the saxophone or something. Um, read some books that aren't about atheism or skepticism or activism. Make some friends who aren't atheist activists and, and do some things with them. And seriously, this is hugely important. Take a break now and then. Take a vacation, take a long weekend, go camping or something. Even just turn off your computer and your phone for a day. 
Even just take short breaks. If it's like you're overloading at a conference, go take an hour and go sit somewhere else. Take a break. And if you're seriously starting to burn out, like really hardcore, consider taking a longer break from activism of like a couple few months. You know, recharge your batteries. Burnout is just like almost every other human problem. It's easier to deal with if you catch it early. You know, if you're starting to seriously burn out, it's better to take a couple of months off now than to totally burn out in a few years and leave activism altogether. You know, and I know, I know, I know there aren't enough hours in the day. You don't have time for a vacation. You don't have time for a hobby. You don't have time to take a break. How can you spend all that time on yourself when there's all this work that needs to be done? You know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> Self-care is not selfish. So get a life. <laughs> Find things you like to do outside atheism. And really closely related to that, find things you like to do within atheism. There are plenty of people in this movement who will try to tell you what kind of activism you should be doing. You know, there's plenty of people who will tell you that we all need to be working on visibility. We all need to be working on community building. We all need to be working on interfaith work or, you know, coalition building with other social change movements, you know, legal work, whatever. You know, and to some extent, I do think it's worth debating what our priorities should be. I mean, certainly on an organizational level, it's totally reasonable to press the organizations who are representing us to focus on issues that matter to us. You know, that's what they're there for, and that's what our job is, is to tell them what we want them to do. And it's worth debating what those issues should be. But ultimately, and especially on an individual level, the kind of activism you should be doing is the kind of activism you enjoy doing. You know, you should be doing whatever activism gets you excited and inspired. I mean, it's hard enough to do, you know, to do activism when you are energized and motivated. You know, doing activism that you've become lukewarm about, that is a recipe for burnout. And we don't want you to burn out. Seriously, we want you to be powerful. And the most powerful form of activism is not visibility, it's not community building, it's not coalition work, it's not even coming out as important as coming out is. The most powerful form of activism is not coming out. The most powerful form of activism is the one that you will stay with because you love it. And there's an important note I want to make about this point, which is that as your life changes, you may find that the kind of activism that inspires you changes. And you may also find that the kind of activism you're capable of doing changes. You know, if you move to an area where there's a strong local atheist community, you might get really inspired to get involved with that community. If you move to an area where there's not a strong local atheist community, uh, you might get inspired to do more activism on the national level or on the internet. You know, or you might get inspired to start a local community. If you get a job with a specialized skill set or knowledge set, uh, you might get inspired to contribute that skill set to the community. You know, wh whether that's knowledge about history, about law, uh, public relations and advertising, web design, graphic design, videography, setting up a sound system. You know, whatever it is that you learn how to do in your life, you can contribute to that. Um, and if you start getting more inspired by some other social change movement, you know, if you start getting more inspired by environmentalism or poverty or drug policy, excellent. You know, I'm not going to tell you, no, you have to stay with atheism for the rest of your life. You have to make atheism your top priority even if you're sick of it. Um, no, I'm not going to tell you that. If you're getting inspired by something else, that's awesome. Go with it. But you might be inspired to maintain your atheist activism in the form of coalition building with these other social change movements, or doing atheist visibility and education within them. Um, if you have kids, you might find yourself getting inspired to form secular parenting groups or daycare centers or doing other you know, family-oriented community building. You know, and frankly, if you have kids, that may be all you have the time and energy to do for a while. Um, if you get a high-stress, high-paying job, um, you may find that the main way that you can contribute to the community is with money. You know, that's not trivial. Believe me, that's not trivial. If there's organization leaders out there, they're going, that's not trivial, please bring it on. Um, and no matter what you're doing or where you are in your life, you can be an out atheist. You know, as out as you can be, as safely as you can be. 
That is not trivial. If that's all you're doing, if that's the only form of activism that you're doing, that is huge. We need all of that. There are jobs for everybody in this movement. You know, so really, do whatever kind of activism you're excited about. And give yourself permission to let that change as your life changes. You know, just because you've always been the one to do you know, volunteer coordinating for the, your local group, you know, if you're getting sick of doing volunteer coordinating for your local group, you know, find somebody else to do it. Train them, pass the baton, and find something else that you love to do. Once again, here we go. Oh, not upside down. Self-care is not selfish. Um, and that leads me to another really hugely important principle of taking care of yourself and avoiding burnout. And this is one that I have struggled with immensely. I mean, I, as much as I'm talking to you all, I'm talking to myself here, you know, just as much. You know, I'm giving myself this pep talk just like I'm giving it to you. Uh, this is as much based on things that I've done wrong as it is things I've done right, and as, as well as things other people have done right and wrong. Um, and that is especially true for this one. You. And imagine that I am talking personally to each one of you here. Imagine that we're out in the corridor, we are having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I am looking you straight in the eyes. You are not, repeat not, single-handedly responsible for the sex act, for the success or failure of the atheist movement. You are not Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You are not Frodo. You know, the entire fate of the world does not rest on your shoulders. The entire fate of atheism does not rest on your shoulders. The entire fate of your atheist group does not rest on your shoulders. And if it does, you need to restructure your group. Um, you know, it is okay to take a break. It's okay to be selective about what projects you get involved with. Uh, it's okay to start with smaller projects and gradually build up to larger ones. Um, it's okay to delegate. It's okay to ask for help. And I'm gonna go down a limb here. I'm gonna say something really freaky, really extreme, really outrageous. When somebody asks you to do something, it's okay to say no. I know, right? Bizarro world. I don't know where I'm getting these ideas from. But seriously, if your time and energy are stretched too thin right now, or if somebody's asking you to do something that's just not in your wheelhouse, it's OK to say no. It's OK to say, look, I'm sorry, but my time and energy are stretched too thin right now. It's OK to say, this isn't in my wheelhouse. This isn't of my area of expertise. I really can't do that. You know, it's nice if you can to direct them to somebody else you know, who has the time and energy and expertise for this particular project. But if you can't, that job is still not your responsibility. I mean, I know this is this totally bizarre, freaky, bizarro world concept. So try to wrap your minds around it. Somebody asking you to do something does not confer moral responsibility on you to do it. And in fact, and this is another lesson that I've had a very hard time learning and that I've, this is like much pain and tears learning this lesson and that I still sometimes have a hard time with. It's better to say no up front than it is to say yes and then do a half-assed job because you didn't have time and energy to do that. Um, and in fact, I wanna do a little participation here. I wanna do a sort of a show of hands here. So organizers, and by organizers, I mean anybody who has asked somebody to do something and whose job it was to kind of keep track of that. If you've ever done that, you're an organizer. Um, if you're asking somebody to take on a project and you have a choice, you have a choice between them saying yes and then flaking out or doing a half-assed job or them saying, no, I really can't do that. You should find somebody else. I want to see a show of hands. Who wants the flaking out and the half-assed job? Now, who wants the honest assessment of people's abilities up front? Keep your hands up and look around. Everybody look around. Apply that to yourself. Remember that the next time somebody asks you to take on a project and you find yourself thinking, sure, I could do that if I quit playing the saxophone, if I quit going to the gym, if I stopped meditating for 20 minutes every day, if I cut back on my sleep from six hours to five, saying no when somebody asks you to take on something that you don't have time and energy for, it may feel like you're disappointing them, 
but you are actually doing them a favor. Remember all those hands up and remember these, everybody else in this room saying you are doing me a favor. If, if you can't do a job, you say no. You know, And you're not just doing them a favor, you are doing the community a favor. You are doing the movement a favor. You're doing the movement a favor because you're taking care of yourself and you're gonna keep yourself from burning out. You know, you're take, you are doing the community and the movement a favor by saying no because you're putting fuel in the car. You're giving water to the fruit tree. You're keeping yourself from burning out and you're keeping yourself in the movement for, a long, for the long haul. You know, and I get it. It can be really hard to look around you and see so much in the world that is terrible, see so much in the world that, that, that should be better, that could be better, that needs to be better. You know, so much that is crying out for help, so much work that needs to be done. You know, I completely, completely and utterly get that. You know, I totally understand the urge to fix all of it at once, to take on everything, to take on everything immediately and to not rest even for a minute until it's all better. I get it. But there is a reason that burnout rates are high in helping professions, helping professions like teaching, like healthcare, and like activism. You know, those of us who are motivated by a strong sense of compassion for others are not always very good at aiming that compassion towards ourselves. You know, we're not always good at putting gas in the car, at nourishing the tree that bears the fruit. You know, now, so of course, I'm not gonna try to talk you out of that compassionate impulse. I'm not gonna talk you out of caring about the things that are terrible in the world and the work that needs to be done. What I will say is that one of the people who is a deserving target of your compassion is you. And I will say that your compassionate impulse will be much better served in the long run if you don't burn out. One more time. Self-care is not selfish. I understand the impulse, I get the impulse, I am right there with you, but I promise you, we are not going to be crushed into a fundamentalist theocracy if you take a vacation. We are not gonna be crushed into a fundamentalist theocracy if you go to the gym, if you go line dancing once a week, if you decide that you would love for your group to do a big Darwin Day event, but you really just can't handle it this year, you know, if you would, if you meditate for 20 minutes a day, you know, if you let somebody else do volunteer coordinating for your group and they don't do as good a job as you do right away, you know, yes, there is harm being done in the world. There is so much potential for the world to be better. And yes, you can change the world. You are going to change the world. You are changing the world right now now but you're not doing it alone you know this is a big movement and it is growing by leaps and bounds every day the weight of the entire world is not on your shoulders the weight of the entire movement is not on your shoulders and you are going to change this world so much more powerfully you are going to help make this world so much of a better place if you stay strong if you stay powerful and if you stay in this movement for many, many years to come.